Well, there's probably more human suffering on this land than any other land in, in America from being a slave breeding plantation prior to the Civil War, and that's how it got its name, Angola, because they used slaves from Angola and Africa. And then after the Civil War, immediately it became a prison, and the family that owned this plantation kept the inmates for free from the state of Louisiana until 1901, and about 10% a year died from malnutrition or disease. So 10-year sentence would be a life sentence. It's a bloody, brutal place. It's the bloodiest prison in America. And so one, one year they had 40 murders in one year. So very brutal in the place, but with God's blessing, it transformed, and so then today it's totally uniquely different prison. Well, I came over about ten and a half years ago, and that's longer than anyone has ever been a warden here because no one survived that long. But the first thing we did is we introduced experiencing God into the prison, and I was one of the facilitators along with the church, the First Baptist Church of Zachary, Louisiana, and so. We got a nucleus, really, of 80 inmates, but there were a lot of inmates that were praying to see it, to see Angola revived and see it change, and praying that you know there were Christians here, Christian inmates, and they just wanted to see the change. And I think God answered their prayer, and I'm really honored to be the vehicle, and that's what it really amounted to. But you know, from that 80 inmates who did experience in God, then we just then each one of them became facilitators, and so we just kind of snowballed it. And thanks to the Southern Baptist Convention and Dr. Blackleby, they provided the books at a discount rate. We couldn't afford to buy them, and, and the church community really got involved, and we started there. And uh, that first year I was here, I had murder. I had all kind of things. I would get called every night, blood everywhere, and I'd always run it back and forth up here. It was a horrible place, and we had to have relief. And so now I don't get any calls hardly at all. You know, we can go about our business, and we have an environment for rehabilitation but it's only through Jesus Christ, through God, that this occurred. I really didn't qualify in a way. I did. I worked for corrections. I have a degree in agriculture, and I'm a teacher. And I'd never worked in a prison until I was a warden of a prison. I ran the farms and industries and all that and so forth. But I'm real proud that all my wardens, assistant warden and deputy warden, are Christians, basically. And every Wednesday morning, we have a Bible study from 8 to 8.30, a little devotional, you know, so that, that sets the stage for the whole prison. So if the leaders aren't leading in the right direction and doing the right thing, then how can you expect the followers to do so? So by us having that little Bible study is symbolic to this whole prison. And there's 1,800 employees here. There's 18,000 acres. There's 5,108 prisoners. And if we don't have that many, I gotta get up and go look for one. We don't lose any sheep here. These 5,000 prisoners have an average sentence of 88 years. 90% of them are gonna die here. There's 3,200 lifers. And I only really have four kind of criminals. Here I have murderers, I have rapists, I have armed robbers, and habitual felons. And uh, so, you know, we have the worst, really, sentences there is in America. We have the longest sentences in America. And so Attica, Sing Sing, Pelican Bay, no penitentiary can have inmates with more time and more of them in one place. And I think that's why God truly, you know, used us at Angola, because I think it was his way of saying, hey, don't say you can't change. If that brutal place in Angola can change, as large as it is with the people with the sentences it has, I mean, what's wrong with you? Dr. Kelly, a man of great vision, that over the seminary realized that to change, you must change from within. So then why shouldn't this prison change from inside? And the way to do that was start this college and change these inmates through education in the college for four years, do the real thing. Guys, I am amazed at what Christ is doing at this institution. Every we think we probably have 2,000 born-again Christians, you know, here, and those people aren't as violent. So therefore, I can focus my resources on the ones who are. So therefore, I just made my, my, my security staff, which is 1,400 people, twice as effective. So I commend the seminary for coming up here and starting the college, and we went to war. And look what God did when we were submissive to Him. And that's what you have to be, a submissive to God, and listen, be silent, like a little kid, and listen. And he'll speak to you and then do what he says, you know, and you'll make the Holy Spirit smile. But the Christian community has got to help. The next step is reentry when we, when we send inmates back into society. But the point is, when you come and you do prison ministry in this environment and you help, you don't know that you're not changing the life of someone who otherwise would get out of prison, commit another crime, and there'd be another victim of violent crime. And, you, and God used you to keep that from happening. Once you start now, inmates in one sense are like teenagers or children. If they, they think you're not going to stay, and they're going to test you. 
and they're not going to be real responsive. But you be persistent. You stay and you come back. If you say, I'm going to be here every Monday night, don't say it if you're not going to do it because they're going to test you. Six months later, you'll be effective. The first six months, don't despair. They're trying to see if you're serious. Just pray, pray, pray for guidance, pray for wisdom, pray for perseverance, and come stick it out, and you'll see results. But you've got to come. I mean, you've got to go. It's a great commission. And if you want to fish for men, the best place to fish is in Peru. Fishing's good here. It's a good hole. I can't talk to my inmates like you can. So you have to come and be involved. And we need your dollars, too because the war costs money. And so everybody can't go to prison. Somebody's got to send them. And so therefore, you're going to have to support it with your finances if you can't go yourself. But you, it's a calling. It's what you're supposed to do, and who's going to do it if you don't? You know? Jesus is the light, the light of the world. And what you're doing is you're creating a church within a prison. So see, we have the Angola Church, and we built these big chapels. And I'm real proud of that. We got chapels and the public gave us some money. We raised over a million dollars for chapel. Now we have church in a chapel, and the chapel, chapel is an island of freedom within the, in the walls of the prison. That's a big deal. <laughs> You'll see the steeples when you drive through this prison. Anywhere on this prison, I want it to be that you look up, you'll see a church steeple. I, I tell you, the greatest thing happened to us. We had a church come here and baptize some inmates and let them be members of their church. And they're going to be members. And they know they have a church home outside waiting for them. And they know if they get out, they have somewhere to go. And somebody's going to maybe help them get a job and welcome them with enthusiasm and, and, just, and just take care of them. And then they can be productive citizens. They don't have to go back to wherever they were that was where violence and, and drugs and everything was. And see, that church really stepped up to the plate and let them be a member, black, white, red, or yellow. Let them in. I mean, what do you want to do? We want to change lives. So the community's got to do what this church did. It's a wonderful thing. And so if you just save one, one person from being murdered or raped or some violent crime, it's worth all the dollars and all the effort we spend. It's worth it all. Just one. Lord God, we will lift up our voice. Prayer changes things. And I want you to know in this prison, I have prayer warriors that are inmates that are praying for this prison and praying it at work. And we saw inmates that say, I want to say I'm sorry to the victims. And we knew then it really had changed their lives. And we had inmates say, we don't mind it. We're not going to be free on this earth, but we're going to be free in heaven. And we know that we're in God's hands and God's in control of everything. In scripture to front, you saw that, Philippians 3.13, we can't change the past, but we can change the future. Ask yourself and sit down in your quiet place and pray about it. What does God want you to do? If you're going to listen, if you're going to listen, you better do the right thing or you're going to make the Holy Spirit frown. That's what my daddy used to tell me when I was a little boy. He said, son, don't make the Holy Spirit frown. Now, y'all make it smile. That's just it.